Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Julie Kaanapu, and you are with Pearl Women's Center tonight for our wonderful webinar on three essential steps to improve weight loss, energy, poor sleep, and brain fog, and of course, a ton more. But um, we're going to give just maybe a couple minutes while people are still coming on board. Um, we have quite a few, or a few hundred, uh, over 100 participants that are joining us this evening. So thank you for your time. Thank you for um, your energy tonight and uh, participating. And I hope that you really gain something from this tonight because that is our goal is to serve you tonight and have a little fun as well. Most of us know how to use Zoom, but just in case, um, I want to make sure everybody can hear us okay and knows where that chat function is. So if you could please click on that chat bar. Um, the bar below, either you have that chat function, or if you don't see that chat function, there is a button that says more with three dots on it. If you click on that, that should show you a chat function, I believe. And if you could please type in, um, if you can hear us okay, or if you can type in um, where you're from this evening. Are you in the Portland area? Be in at um, and Denise is going to help us out and see and, and read and review back to us. So Denise, are you seeing anybody um, typing in if they can hear us okay? No, right now, nobody's typing in at this time. Okay. And let's make sure. We'll just give a little more time. And I'll see if we can. See more of this here. Rick, uh, Dr. Rosenfeld just uh, sent in a test message. There we go. There's a test. Okay. And Denise, I'm going to let you go ahead and continue to just interrupt us and let us know when we have some um, questions or some answers typed in. Okay. And just give a couple minutes here then. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, thank you so much everybody for um, being here this evening and uh, taking the time to learn a little more and uh, have a little fun. We have some uh, great things to offer you tonight. And uh, with no further ado, I want to introduce um, an amazing panel that we have here and starting out with someone that probably doesn't need any introduction. But Dr. Rosenfield is a board certified physician and surgeon and gynecologic surgeon, of course, the founder and owner of Pearl Women's Center. He's widely known for his minimally invasive approaches to uh, surgical procedures, has lectured nationally and internationally about the outpatient approach to hysterectomy, value based healthcare, enhanced recovery after surgery, amongst other topics. He's pioneered new techniques and surgical approaches in the field of gynecology. His passion for women's health care led to being elected the Board of Trustees of the AAGL, medical society focused on the education of surgeons and patients alike. With over 20 years of experience, Dr. Rosenfeld has created a vision to change the way women's health care is approached. So Dr. Rosenfeld, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right, great. Well, uh, thanks to everybody on our team. Uh, Denise and Jordan, and of course, Jade uh, and uh, the BioT folks as well for putting this together. Uh, this is really exciting for us. We um, have just recently engaged in, uh, in, in using BioT for our patients, and uh, this is going to be a really great talk. I was actually unfamiliar with BioT until this year. So really exciting. I'd heard about hormone pellets in the past, but wasn't really clear on, 
uh, mechanism of action and the benefit for patients. So this is exciting for us. The reason that I'm here is, uh, first of all, to talk just briefly about Pearl Women's Center uh, and then about, you know, about our growth and, and also about uh, sort of our, our holistic approach to women's health. And so um, my main focus is as a surgeon, but before patients are signing up for surgery, a lot of times they're coming into Pearl Women's Center or offices like ours with all kinds of issues or problems or really no problems at all, just for general health. And one of the most important things that we deal with is hormonal health. And as women age, really starting from their uh, early teenage years, all throughout the life, they go through a journey. Uh, and that journey really is a massive transition. Uh, and it's a lot of communication between the brain and the ovaries and the uterus, both in the early phases of uh, being be becoming fertile, uh, going through the years of pregnancy, of course, and then uh, into the perimenopausal and menopausal years. And a lot of times as physicians and science people were trained about hormone levels and we're always taught about this range of normal. And oftentimes these ranges are really big ranges. And so the reality, as we start thinking about how do we balance hormones and help patients out is recognizing that not everybody feels the same on one end of a bell curve or another where they're told things are normal. And I, I felt that there was a big gap in the type of healthcare we were delivering at the Pearl, where we really wanted to start working with our patients and understanding what they were going through and offering them some support, both uh, clinically and then also with medication. And so um, that's really the reason why we're here and doing this tonight is to provide some education and some resources. And um, as a surgeon, uh, oftentimes patients are referred to me when ovulatory function or hormonal function is really out of whack and surgical services are needed, but a lot of times they're not needed. And so that's where we bring in our other core expertise in the office with both Jade, and we also have Dr. Aaron Conlin, who's a naturopathic physician at our practice. Um, that's it in a nutshell. So uh, really wanna save this for, uh, for you guys to give the lecture. Um, I believe that I'm gonna have the pleasure of introducing uh, our next slide, which is also our next uh, speaker briefly, which is going to be uh, Jade Carboy. And um, we really couldn't be more excited to welcome Jade on, on our staff. Uh, she arrived, I believe it was in January, Jade, I think was your yeah. beginning of your employment with us. Um, Jade comes to us with some really just powerhouse academic training under her belt. Uh, at institutions like Emory and Vanderbilt. Uh, she then made her way through New Mexico. We share that in common. We both worked in New Mexico for a while before she landed in Oregon and she's been down in Eugene and over in Bend. Uh, her sister is a surgeon here in Oregon as well. And so we're really glad to have Jade on board. Uh, she comes to us with a really great depth of, uh, of experience and knowledge. Um, she is just a pleasure to talk to. She's a lovely person, loves the outdoors, um, and uh, she's really, really excited about uh, growing her panel of patients here at the Pearl. So I would love to hand it off to you guys, and I'm going to sit back and listen and learn just like everybody else. Um, always happy to answer questions. We would love for you to reach out uh, to the Pearl Women's Center. You can email us info at pearlwomencenter.com or you can always just give us a call if you wanna come in for consultation with any of our providers. We have a lot of information on our website too. So really excited to be here. Thank you guys so much. I'm done rambling. I'm gonna hand off to you. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And I, I guess the one other person that we wanted to introduce tonight too was um, Denise. And even though your picture says Jordan, just had to hop on another uh, computer there. Um, did you wanna introduce a little bit about Denise or would you like me to? Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Okay. Well, I've known Denise for a short time, but I can definitely tell you that she's one of the most sweetest and genuine persons I know. And working with a lot of MAs across the country, um, I don't just say that, I mean it. Um, but anyway, she's graduated in the last 20 years, have had experience all over as a medical um, assistant, supporting her community here in the Pacific Northwest, of course. Um, her strong belief so that every patient she meets is her most valuable patient. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, she works directly with Jade and helping her and supporting each patient and their unique health needs. And excited to have BioT at the clinic and to see the positive outcomes and the patients at Pearl's Women Center. So Denise, thank you so much for joining us and being on here tonight as well. Thank she you. is going to, yes. 
Um, Denise is going to help um, read off any questions and everything. And if everybody or anybody would please type in the chat, um, maybe how you heard about tonight or um, what are you drinking? You having wine? You having some healthy water? <laughs> you, uh, you with a friend or your sister or your mom? If you could just type something in the chat, um, that would be great. And Denise will uh, be helping us out that way. And also let us know where you're from, where you're, where you're calling where in you're from. from. That'd be great. Yeah, where you're at. Are you in Portland or, or somewhere else? The other thing I would love to know is what is maybe the one main thing that you are wanting to gain from tonight? Or what was the one thing or three or maybe a dozen, but what was the one thing that actually brought you here tonight that you wanted to attend? And I really want to, again, be able to serve you tonight and to make sure that you're at least taking away some of the reasons that you're, you even uh, joined tonight too. So, okay. Um, and without further ado, um, just to introduce myself a little bit and really I like to really share my story of how I even got involved with this. And um, there was a time about five, six years ago, maybe I was doing a speaking event. Um, it was live and it was, I don't know, about room 75 people or so. And afterwards, you know, you talk um, to people one-on-one. -on -one. I was talking to a couple women and I could feel another woman come up to me and I just kind of happened to glance over and she just, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to say thank you. And she reached out her hand. So I shook it and I could feel this hard piece of folded up paper, right? And pressed it in my hand. And I could tell she didn't want me to know anybody else knew about it. So I, you know, grabbed it and just kept the hand and said, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And continued my conversation and she left. So after we kind of fizzled out and I felt it was appropriate to open it, that note was actually a suicide note. She had planned that evening initially to kill herself because she never felt listened to. She mm. felt in pain. She felt out of her own skin, uncontrollable. And she said that that evening, she finally felt someone understood what she was going through or understood how she felt or understood that she was listened to. And um, she said that in her note, she, that she would wait and she would try this. And all she left was that it was a 61-year-old female. That was it. And this is that note. And I carry this because I, I truly am passionate about what I do because about 25 years prior, I had no idea about hormones or the power of them or when optimized, optimized correctly, the power of reducing symptoms of aging and all those symptoms that we start to have, but also reducing risk of disease. And it wasn't until I was working with doctors across the country that one asked me, they said, Julie, what are the doctors doing about hormones? said, I don't know. What are you doing? You know? And he's like, well, conventional methods that I learned in medical school. I don't know, just creams, patches, injections, but I'm not getting the outcomes that I want. And my patients are getting the outcomes that they want. And I'm frustrated. So it put me on a mission of research and education. And fast forward 10 years later, I have been involved with BioT. I've been going through the certification process. I assist with the trainings. Um, I've also gone through um, certification of health and wellness um, coaching and World Link Medicals and all of this knowledge. Now I've been able to help and empower. And that's one of my goals tonight, to empower you, to energize you, to give you options so you can talk openly um, with Jade or someone at Pearl Women's Center who understands optimizing hormones because normal is not optimal. And you'll hear me say that a lot tonight. Okay, so there's three main things that I'd like to, to share with you this evening. And really one is why hormones, right? What role do they really have in disease prevention? Because I know some of us have heard that don't hormones cause um, you know, disease or cancer. So we'll talk about that too. Um, number two, synthetic versus bio or human identical hormones and routes of administration. Are they different? Does it make a difference? And number three, hormone replacement therapy is definitely not a one size fits all approach and you need an expert, but how can you tell who's an expert or not? Time in the industry doesn't necessarily mean that they've taken the extra time to research and, and be knowledgeable in this topic. But luckily you've definitely got someone here at Pearl's Women's Center who does. So number one, basically hormones. Why hormones? What are hormones? They're chemicals. They're made by the gland, you know, glands to control certain actions of cells and organs. They tell us what to do. They're our coach. Um, there are synthetic versus bioidentical. And when you say hormones, that's a big umbrella. We got to know which ones we're talking about. But they are like a, like a, a key and lock function. You can see that as like a messenger. 
if you have the wrong key in your ignition and has anybody put the wrong key in their car before back when we had keys i guess now it's a push button right um back when we had keys and you want to turn the car on you can't it won't start the car but now it's stuck and you kind of freak out you can't take it out um then finally it comes out that's almost like a synthetic hormone coming and attaching to the receptor sites it attaches it can relieve some benefit but then it's stuck and then you have this gunk that's left over your body doesn't know how to metabolize it a bioidentical or human identical hormone is that right key. It's the right key that fits into that receptor site or your car, turns it on, unleashes it, your body knows what to do with it and can metabolize it correctly as well. So there's a huge difference between which hormone we're talking about. Really what we're trying to solve for is how do you feel? Are you feeling a little more irritable? Everybody else around you has a problem, <laughs> harder to sleep. Um, these are the symptoms that, you know, we start to have as we age. And that's our main question is how do you feel? What we want to feel is happy in our own skin. Now, this of course is just stock photography, but it's just people. And what we want to represent is you feeling your best in your own skin. And some of these symptoms that I was talking about as we age, and I experienced this when I was back creeping into my forties before I was realizing what pellets or bio or optimizing hormones was, is this fatigue. Um, I was starting to have this, you know, dragging in the end of the afternoon, like I had needed a Starbucks or needed a nap, um, mood swings and anxiety. I was definitely a little more irritable around my kids. Um, lack of sleep or poor sleep. My symptoms was not waking up at night or harder to fall asleep. I just couldn't get enough sleep. My husband, he would wake up in the middle of the night, have a hard time falling asleep. Um, memory loss. Anyone walk into a room? Forget why you walk into a room. <laughs> if you could put in the chat, actually, some of these symptoms maybe that you've experienced, I would love to know kind of where we're at with this. Um, that lack of focus, right? You're working, maybe an hour or two go by and you realize, what have I really done? You know, that, that focus, that mental clarity is not quite there as much anymore. Brain fog, depression, um, depression, just more like, uh, oh, what's that movie? Groundhog's Day, right? Feel like your hamster wheel. You just wake up, same thing happens, come home, repeat. Um, that vitality of life just isn't quite there anymore. Hot flashes and night sweats. So here's a writer downer. And if you have a piece of paper or a pen, I encourage you to grab one. But hot flashes is something that most women are familiar with that starts on our chest, right? And actually flushes or flashes up through our face can last 10 seconds, can last 40 seconds, can have one dozen, two dozens a day. Majority of that happens with women, but sometimes it can happen with men. That is typically an estrogen deficiency. Anything other than that start and that flush is not a hot flash. It's probably a night sweat. So a night sweat is yes, if you're sweating at night, kick off the covers, you know, break out into a sweat, but it's also kind of like um, you know, when you're pregnant and they say, oh, morning sickness, Come on, ladies, it's not always just in the morning, right? It can happen any time of day. So night sweats don't just happen at night. I was having night sweats and didn't realize it. I was just hot. Um, you, know, you get out of the shower, start putting makeup on, and, and just start getting warm or perspiring a little bit. Um, that can be seen as a testosterone deficiency. And when we, a lot of times, I've seen physicians as well as people, uh, patients do this, they group that just getting hot as a hot flash in general. And if you go to a physician who is not understanding the difference between the two and group that together as well, you might be getting the wrong hormone. And if you get that wrong hormone, you got, might get what I call the bad bees, bitchiness, breast tenderness, bloating and bleeding. Nobody likes those. So other symptoms, you know, weight gain unexplained, harder to lose weight, joint pain, Bladder symptoms, dry, uh, decreased sex drive and or performance for men or women, libido, sexual thoughts, fantasies, etc. So Denise, are there anybody, does anybody have any, am I the only one that had some of these? No, symptoms? no, we have, we, we have several here that um, are having a lot of, you know, several with hot flashes, the mood swing, low libido, weight gain, trouble losing weight. Okay, I'm not alone. Thank you guys. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing. Okay, so let's talk about which hormones. So there's a lot of hormones in our body, but majority of hormones we're gonna talk about tonight is estrogen, testosterone, and then maybe a little bit of progesterone and thyroid. Um, but estrogen, there is over 400 functions in our body and about 3,500 women enter menopause daily. But these symptoms can happen about 15 years 
before menopause. So does anybody know, put in the chat, if you know the average age and the earliest age that um, menopause has been, been to shown, I guess. Um, average age, I'll give you a hint, it's about 51. Earliest age is around 40. So if anyone can do the quick math, 15 years minus 40 puts us at what age? 25, right? Especially with a couple pregnancy cycles, those little buggers just take everything out with us, right? Or with them. Um, so most women, you know, might be told, oh, it's just, it's just a part of aging. You'll get through it. Um, you know, it's nothing to get through. We shouldn't have called it menopause. It's meant to stop, right? There's no going back. <laughs> There's no play button. Um, but it can be present in men and women. Estrogen is extremely important in men. It's just not the amount, you know, the amounts that are different. Um, progesterone. Progesterone is one that, of course, counterbalances with that estrogen. Estrogen builds up the endometrial lining in the uterus, right? Progesterone keeps it in check. So it's almost like estrogen's that fertilizer and progesterone's the lawnmower. Um, but other things that progesterone do, even if you don't have a uterus, if you've had a hysterectomy, it can help with breast tissue, endothelial function, promotes weight loss. It's a natural diuretic, normalizes blood clotting factors. You can see all of these things that progesterone can be beneficial for helps with mood, even PMS, even younger women um, who have bad PMS can help with progesterone. Um, tons of things, but we have to need, um, of course, a physician who can understand how to give at the right times and the right amounts. Testosterone, one of my favorites. Do you guys know that women can lose up to 50% of their testosterone by age 40? By age 40, we can lose 50%. And testosterone is more abundant in a woman's life than estrogen is. And we put all of this focus on estrogen, which is important. But testosterone is a huge, huge important hormone in a woman's life. Men can lose up to 1% to 3% production of testosterone per year over year. And I've seen many physicians that argue that's got to be higher because we're seeing more men and men, more men younger and younger with lower and lower testosterone. <laughs> But the other cool thing that I've seen and I've experienced, testosterone and hormones in general can protect main areas. There's five main areas, and that's brain, bone, heart, breast, and prostate, right down there. So brain, bone, heart, breast, and prostate are the main areas that we can reduce risk of disease, Alzheimer's and dementia. We can reduce heart disease, number one killer in America for men and women. We can reduce breast cancer, reoccurrence, and mortality. We can re re reduce and even reverse osteopenia osteoporosis, and we can reduce the risk of prostate cancer and or severity of it. But the other cool thing is that it can also protect relationships. And I found it an interesting statistic that the peak time of age that our hormones start to fall is also the peak time of age where most divorces happen. And if you think about it, why I found that so fascinating is because those symptoms we we're just talking about, and I've been married for 24 years, love my husband to death, but reverse eight years before we had our hormones optimized, we were both tired. We were both irritable, right? Um, no libido, didn't want to help out with dishes and dinner and kids and homework and all this stuff. And we're too exhausted to have anything happen in the bedroom anyway. So it was, it was dull, you know, compared to, oh my gosh, revitalized, we're both much more energy. We um, are less irritable, right? Nicer to each other, have more energy to go do things. And of course, a little friskier as well. So I've seen many, many people just improve their relationships. Now, I'm not saying that this solves everything, but it definitely can help. Thyroid. If anybody said or have thought that there's something wrong with my thyroid, but every time you get it checked, you've been told it's normal. Is there anybody in the chat that would, oh, Denise had to step away for a second. Um, Thyroid is hugely underdiagnosed in regards to it being normal versus optimal. And we're going to talk about what that means too. But thyroid is very similar in symptoms along with testosterone. But that fatigue, anybody have cold hands, cold feet, cold all the time, constipation, dry skin, brittle nails, thinning hair, outer third eyebrows thinning, muscle weakness, cholesterol, metabolism. A lot of people said weight gain, harder to lose weight stiffness, menstrual periods, being heavier, tons of things that you're, when you're 
thyroid is optimized correctly can improve some of these symptoms dramatically. So number two killer in America is cancer. We used to have one in 20 risk in 1940. Today it's one in eight for breast cancer. Some are saying one in seven, um, which is huge. And we have seen multiple studies. Um, re two recent ones have come out showing a 35.5 and a 40% reduction when using testosterone in breast cancer reoccurrence and mortality. But does anyone remember what number one killer America is? I know Denise, you're, you're coming back into that chat, but yeah. Number one killer is heart disease. One in seven pre-menopausal women will die of heart disease. Where one in, I'm sorry, did I say one in seven yet? Where one in three will die from heart disease after menopause. And what do we lose after menopause? We lose estrogen, right? That estradiol is so, so important. And Jade, do you think talking with women that they they realize that heart disease and breast cancer is is you know, something that hormones can reduce that risk? Or do you think they think the opposite? Maybe? I think the opposite. I think I, I have so many patients that come to me with such a misunderstanding about what hormones, uh, what role they play in after menopause, you know, and most are very, very afraid of even introducing hormones. Sure. Um, so a huge part of this is just, yeah, educating women and kind of getting an understanding that hormones are actually very, very protective um, and kind of clearing up that, that misconception. Right, I'm glad you said that. So we'll definitely touch on that where we think, you know, are they harmful or are they helpful and what's the difference or which hormones we're we talking about. Thanks for sharing. Alzheimer's, do you guys know that women get Alzheimer's eight to one over men? I always thought because we might be multitaskers, we can do a little more for our brains. But if you think about it, women deficient on estrogen are 50% more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Estradiol is a huge protector of the brain. Um, men with low testosterone are three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, men, women, we make testosterone, we make estradiol. That's how we get the majority of it. Men get the majority of their estrogen from their testosterone, converting into estrogen. So if they have low testosterone, they're going to have even lower, um, lower estrogen. So I pulled this up. I thought it was interesting. I wanted to know what the top 10 killers in America was. And yes, this was back in 2006. I realized that, but I did this on purpose because back in 2006, heart disease, cancer, number one, number two. But what I thought was interesting between five and six, you see that where it says medical errors. Medical errors would have been the number five or six tied of death in the US. So that's either drug, drug interactions, um, you know, miss uh, diagnosis or surgeries or whatever it might be. And then I thought, okay, well, let me fast forward at least 10 years. They've got to improve somehow, right? Somewhere. Oops. Heart disease, still number one, cancer, still number two, and medical errors is now number three. And this was 2013 and 16. So I need to pull another one now coming up on almost, you know, 10 more years maybe and see where we're at. But the statins, the, I'm not here to talk all about you know, that or cancer and um, going through treatments, um, but obviously it's not working very well. And um, right now, actually, I'm, I'm dealing and, and learning even more with um, dementia. My mom's struggling with dementia. My dad's struggling with cancer right now. And, and you know, it's very interesting to me um, and why I'm so passionate to educate more on ways to prevent the disease, you know, put on our seat belts, put on our helmets, our elbow pads and knee pads. Nothing is 100% full uh, bulletproof, right? But we can be preventative and proactive. So hormones that have shown that to be protective against multiple diseases. We have seen protection against breast cancer, cardiovascular disease. All of these, again, I've talked about that you can see on your screen, but it has to be the right hormone and it needs to be in the right amount. Down at the bottom, I have references that I just wanted to show. I'm not going to read every single one of these slides, but I want to show and tell you that this is from evidence-based literature. It's not just because I'm saying so. It's not just because I want you to believe me. I want you to believe what there's literature out there. Um, but again, it's just showing that there's a highly effective um, in prevention of heart disease with estrogen and postmenopausal estrogen is associated with 35 to 50% reduction risk of cardiovascular disease. 
So I kind of ask you, where do you want your levels to be? Do you want them to drop off or do you want them to be optimal? Low testosterone, independently associated with type two diabetics. Anybody have type two or pre-diabetes? Deaths due to all cause. Deficiencies associated with insulin resistance, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, coronary events. Internal medicine shows that low testosterone's predicted increased risk of death. Women on estrogen suffered 80% cardiac events less than untreated women. So I ask you again, do you want to be treated? Do you want to be optimal or do you want to be without? This study I really, really like. This is a journal of National Cancer Institute and they took hormone replacement therapy after diagnosis of breast cancer. So every single woman, there was, uh, gosh, I think about through almost close to 3000 women in this, every single one of them obviously had diagnosed breast cancer and they split them into two groups, right? You have your users and your non-users and your hormone users saw, saw a rate of breast cancer reoccurrence 17 per thousand. However, if you chose not to use hormones, there was 30 per thousand. If you chose to use hormones, the mortality rates were five per thousand. If you chose not to use hormones, it was 15 per thousand. And total mortality was 16 per thousand in users of hormones and 30 per thousand if you did not. So which group would you like to be in? And I find that very powerful in regards to after diagnosis of breast cancer. Okay, so moving on to section two, that's all I have to say about the protection of hormones. I wanted to show you some studies and references. Um, the second thing we want to discuss and just empower you to, to learn more about is synthetic versus bioidentical hormones and routes of delivery. And has anybody heard that hormones cause cancer? I have. Has anybody heard that hormones can prevent or reduce risk of cancer? Obviously, you just heard that, right? And which is true? Well, they're both true. So let's see why. Um, the Women's Health Initiative and why I believe why there's such a big kind of scare still out there or uneasiness or unknowns they feel of using hormones is the Women's Health Initiative back in 2002. So prior to this, um, women were being prescribed hormones and the majority of the hormones that were my, maybe being used was a synthetic um, estrogen. And that was called Premarin. That comes from pregnant mare's urine. And because that's an estrogen, even though it's synthetic, um, if you have a uterus, right, we need that progesterone. So there was a synthetic progestin, which is not true progesterone, that was named Provera. So you had Premarin and Provera. And they decided, you know what, why don't we take both and put it into one pill, we'll call it Prempro. And they did a study on Prempro as well as an arm study on estrogen. And what they saw with the synthetic progestin was an increased risk of breast cancer and some other diseases, stroke. What they did not come out with was that the ARM study of just estrogen, even if it was um, Premarin, even if it was synthetic, did not have the disease or the breast cancer risk that the progestin, the Prem Pro side did. But it took them 14, 16 years later to come back and say, oops, yeah, sorry. Well, the damage has already been done. There was an association of 80,000 80, excess deaths due to women avoiding estrogen. You know, women didn't want to take it anymore. Physicians were um, scared to prescribe it. And it was really unfortunate because it was that shock value in the news that uh, led everybody in this direction and waited so long to come back and say, we made, you know, a little bit of a mistake, but they didn't send that out, you know, in the news like they did the first one. And Jade, I know Dr. Rosenfeld, I don't know if you can hear it now or not, but you've been around over 20 years um, just curious if you wanted to add anything about, you know, being in practice before or after, or Jade, what you hear, um, you know, in the, there you are, um, just in with colleagues or, or patients or anything like that. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I still, I mean, I speak with colleagues still and there's confusion with, you know, my peers and, uh, people who are in women's health, it's still very prominent that there's this fear that hormones cause cancer. And I think a huge portion of this is that it's not all hormones are created equal. And there's a big confusion about what is bioidentical and what is synthetic, um, what that actually means when it comes to your healthcare and your benefit to hormones. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. Yeah, our, our experience. Before and after. 
Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was at Kaiser working. Uh, I, that was my first job. And our phones were ringing off the hook because people were panicking uh, when the study first came out. A um, couple things about the study. First of all, it wasn't really a great study. Uh, it was a lot, a huge number that was amazing. You know, this, this incredibly large number of women that, that were studied. But the problem is, is that people were included as potentially having heart disease if they came into the emergency room with some sort of chest pain. And then later on, they found that it was like heartburn. Uh, so there, there was some problems there when they look back at it. Uh, I actually remember I went down to a, uh, an, a, a boards prep course and Leon Spiroff, who was a big name up at OHSU, um, who wrote a textbook on hormones and, and reproductive uh, endocrinology was speaking and saying, yeah, the study is completely confounded. It was one of the first times I'm like, wow, something that I thought was really definitive is now being refuted. So the real crux of it was that, first of all, when women start taking hormone therapy before or during the transition of menopause, it seems to absolutely be protective and not a problem. So a lot of the concern was when women went through menopause and then began taking hormone therapy with a significant interval of time between going, you know, beginning menopause and starting hormone therapy. So that was one concern. And the other one, of course, was just study design. Uh, so it was, and, and it's still been a trickle down problem and people are concerned about it. And even the North American Menopause Society has intermittently changed its recommendations about hormone therapy, where people should be asking themselves each year, you know, why am I on hormone therapy? And if you don't have a good answer, then, then maybe you shouldn't be on it. But I think this is a pretty compelling argument hearing all of these amazing things that hormones can do for you, that most of our patients have a pretty good answer as to why they're on hormones. So that's sort of our sense over the years uh, on, on how this played out. But it was, um, it was a flawed study. It created a lot of stress, still does. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and that's that word again you hear, should you be on hormones or not? Well, again, we gotta ask which type of hormones. Because when we're looking at looking at that molecular structure, progesterone, this is what our body makes. This is actual progesterone. In the study was a medroxyprogesterone acetate. It's a progestin. It's a fake progesterone. You can see all these other little chicken scratches. It's a different molecular structure. It acts differently in our body. Um, same thing with estrogen. There's human, there's three types of estrogen, but you can see the differences. The horse estrogen, the equine, the premarin, um, and then even testosterone. You know, this is pure testosterone that men and women make. And then your cypionate, your enethate, which are synthetic. So there, there's going to be a difference. You use a different key, you're going to different get, get a different outcome. And there's tons and tons and tons of literature I can continue to show you. I, I'll, I'll spare you the time. But that show, even at a later year and age, are completely safe. That decade of time or waiting later, it was more harmful when using a synthetic. That's exactly what he's talking about. So again, it's that lock and key. And what we've seen in different routes of administration that we'll talk about too is in osteoporosis. So this stud study was done a couple times and it showed the differences between a patch and a pellet and oral estrogen. And we slough off bone like we do you know, dry skin and um, we can gain that back. Testosterone is that bone builder and estrogen is that bone maintainer. So if we're losing testosterone, possibly 50% by age 40, obviously we're not building back as much bone matrix as we were before. Mm -hmm. And then we go through menopause and we lose that estrogen that's holding on to what we have. No wonder osteoporosis and osteopenia happens mostly in our 60s. You don't see it in our 20s. So we can actually give that testosterone and we have seen 8.3% increased bone uh, growth, bone density, year over year and it's been amazing really really cool um just one a couple more internal medicine showing that combined estrogen testosterone um the use of risk and the oral synthetic testosterone increased risk but bioidentical did not and actually lowered protective uh, had a protectiveness um older men declining in anabolic hormones a strong independent predictor of mortality and multiple hormone deficiencies is a robust biomarker of a health status and that was also internal medicine. Nurses Health Study is another great large study, very large study, showing again that conjugated or synthetic hormones increase risk 
and estrogen plus testosterone, there was no increased risk. One of the questions I have here is uh, what the, she wants to know, what do we ask for in our annual physical to see if we need this, if any of these hormones are needed? So what, what would a patient ask? Okay, cool. If you're coming to see um, Jade, then they're going to have the right type of kind of a symptom health assessment form to look at your symptoms because we care about you how you feel along with some blood work. Um, and we'll do all of our, I'm sorry, Denise, too, I'm going to answer this question, but we'll keep track of those questions. We'll do all Q and A's and all answers all night long if you need me to, to make sure we answer everybody's question. Um, but we want to look at blood work. We want to know where your baseline is, right? Your normal production and how you feel those two things together. Um, I can't tell you what number you're going to feel or function your best. Only, you know, that. So Jade will be able to set your dose appropriately and you'll be able to set the frequency. And I'll get into a little more detail about that too. Thank you for your question. This is just a little example of, you know, that roller coaster ride with other delivery methods versus a pellet. Um, and honestly, you know, I never knew what a pellet was before either. I associated it with my childhood rabbit. <laughs> I thought it, you know, it, my rabbit ate pellets, it pooped pellets, and actually we named it pellets. So <laughs> um, I'm very, very glad I've learned about them and, and I have them. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about there in regards to synthetic versus bioidentical. And the last section that we want to discuss is talking about normal isn't optimal. And it's how some providers that, you know, Dr. Rosenfeld and Jade have already stated that some uh, colleagues of theirs still believe that hormones might be bad um, and others are saying that hormones are good. So what does that do for us as the patient? And that's where I become so passionate and wanting to educate and talk to more women, especially, is that you, I want you to understand that not all doctors understand. And that's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around, but they just weren't trained that way. And over 6,000 providers that I've worked with haven't talked to every single one of them, but there is a more than a thousand um, that I have physically talked to and asked, did you learn this in med school? Or what are your thoughts? And every single one of them said no. And I know I've talked to you, Jade, and you've said, uh, Dr. Rosenfeld, I haven't asked you yet, but um, it takes someone who wants to know more. It takes someone who wants to continue that education. And that's what you have here with Jade. You have someone who cares and wanted to know more and knew there was more out there. It takes the time to have studies and educates and, and continues to learn. So one physician, again, might say, nope, hormones are bad. They're probably thinking of that women's health initiative. we got to break it down. Which hormones are you talking about? We're not doing synthetic. We're talking about hormones are good because it's true hormones. It's true hormones, exactly what our body has been making since we've been in the womb. Okay. So coming back another, to also that question. Yeah. Julie, another question um, that came up is uh, they want to know if the pellet can be removed. Good question. So pellets don't need to be removed um, when you have someone who is dosing them appropriately. And we're going to talk about the, um, uh, the pros and cons of that too. Um, if you could hold on to those questions, Denise, so we can get through this too, and I'll definitely okay. appreciate it. Um, so when I'm talking about and answering more of that question, um, what do we need? We need blood work. We need to know where you're starting at. Now, a lot of times too, one physician may only test a certain number of tests. Another one might be more robust. So one, you got to ask which tests are you looking at um, to make sure that you know what you're talking about or you, you know what you're looking at. So when we look at normal versus optimal and what my blood levels say, when it comes to hormones, it's a little bit different. It can be a little trickier, but it is pretty simple. So we got to think about, okay, what is this reference range, right? You get labs and you're told you're normal, but there is no normal, right? The lab slip says expected reference range. So, okay, you think expected, meaning probably average of a population, which is true. They take average of a population, cut down the low, cut up the high, and you're left with this nice bell curve, right? Well, the second question we need to ask is which lab is right? Because every lab has a little bit different on expected reference ranges. So there's a little bit of fudging or gray areas there, but they all, all are pretty much in the same range. The other question, the third question you need to ask is where are they getting this population? Most of the time, it's not the healthy people running down the road. You can't catch them and they're not sick. 
most of the time, it's an average of a population that's in the hospital, and most of them might be old, sick, and tired. So if you fit within this normal or expected range, reference range, congratulations, you're normal, and that's old, sick, and tired. <laughs> we don't want to be normal. We want to be optimal. And where that number is for you is going to be different for everybody and why it's extremely important to be individualized in your therapy. Everybody should be dosed to what you need, not a blanket approach, you know, starting one size fits all. It doesn't work. So we want to treat your symptoms. We want to treat you, not your lab number. We're using the lab number as a guide, as a piece of the puzzle to look at the whole picture. Make sense? This is a great study. This is a German study, one of my favorites. And this shows on your left-hand side, numbers of you know, 200 to 900. Now this is men and testosterone levels in one lab, their reference ranges. And most labs that I see, their expected reference ranges, right? It might be around 300 to 900, 300 to 800. And if we use it as a general rule of thumb, nobody quote me, we know that men need 10 times the amount of testosterone that a female does, right? So again, general rule of thumb, if we cut off a zero on these, we can kind of apply it to women. So my husband, um, 53 at the time was 45, he had his blood levels checked and he was at 336, 26, excuse me, 326. Completely normal to the provider that we first had his labs looked at. And you're good, you don't need testosterone. Well, in the insurance world, that was true. He didn't need testosterone and they went pay for it. However, when his level dropped below 900, every single one of these disease process, the risk started to increase. And I said, you know, babe, I kind of want you around, you know, overall cause of all mortality at 600. So my level in my late thirties, creeping into my forties was 26. Um, and now, I am at a threshold where I feel better and I'm protected. So it's kind of a question to ask you, where do you want your levels to be? Even though this is within an expected range or normal range, what do you want to be protected of? So it kind of comes hand in hand with, with levels along with where you feel your best. And where you feel your best is going to be when the hormone works in at the cellular level, right? The serum, your blood level, you might have serum going by, but if you have receptors that are resistant and everyone's aware of like insulin resistance, right? We all know what that is. Well, we have resistance on our hormone receptors. We have resistance on all receptors and it depends on your lifestyle, body and everything that maybe how resistant you are or not, but someone that doesn't have or does have a lot of resistance in their receptors need more in their blood serum to be able to get in and work at the cellular level. For someone who doesn't have resistance and they're very you know fresh or fertile however you want to explain that they don't need as much in their serum level to get the same effect at the cellular level so that's why someone might be on the higher or lower side of a level but nobody can tell you where you're going to feel and function your best there is no number and dr Har uh, dr morgenthaler harvard urologist uh, did an international consensus back in 2016 and he's talking about for that specific reason, they are encouraging clinicians to use a clinical based threshold rather than laboratory reference ranges to help with the decision making and testosterone values. All that means is how do you feel? Remember that symptom list? If you're having those symptoms, let's take a look at it with the blood work to see if we can improve levels to improve your symptoms. Okay. And we are just trying to put you back where you were before. You know, you had high levels. We all had higher levels in our teens and 20s. And we start to drop off. We're trying to put you back into that optimal, normalized, hate that word normal, but optimized level for you and where you feel your best. So BioT has a method. And our method includes a lot more than just pellets. But it is the right kind of hormone, right? Bioidentical versus synthetic. It's the right amounts. It needs to be individualized dosing for you specifically and the right, right delivery system. Um, and that might not be pellets for you, but we have about a 94 patient retention rate that is working very, very well for very many. Um, and that is also optimizing testosterone, thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, and some nutraceuticals or, or other hormones like vitamin D for that gut health, brain, heart, and hormone metabolism 
system and relationships. So before we get to those QAs, just a couple take homes. Again, hormones, when they're optimized correctly, we can improve multiple symptoms of aging and reduce many risks of diseases. Bioidentical versus synthetic is imperative for safety and long-term benefits, not risk. How you feel is imperative to address along with the labs, not your labs alone. And you need an expert, which you have one here. And I'm so happy and, and grateful to be working with Jade and Jordan and, and Dr. Rosenfeld, the whole team at Pearls Wyman Center. They have really embraced and wanting to truly stand next to their mission to you know, help women's uh, health care and, and give you all the options you have and you um, that are out there to make an educated decision together. So now we are on for, uh, wait, before we do gifts, can you, Denise, please see what questions are there? We're going to do some Q and A's here. And then we have some great gifts, you guys. They are amazing. I would stick around. Um, they're going to do some drawings and a name. So Denise, what are some questions we have that there, please? Well, it looks like we got um, one, one question here regarding the cost. Uh, in reference to whether the estrogen and testosterone would be separate costs. Um, okay. So depending on your dose, um, like for me, I would, I'll always use myself. My husband knows I talk about him all the time. Um, I only get testosterone. Obviously my mom gets testosterone and estradiol. My husband obviously only gets testosterone. Regardless of your dose, if they, you do a pellet uh, therapy or pellet procedure, it is, this, it is a one, is it a one-time cost. Um, I know, and you're coming in, the first thing that we want to do is, again, ask how you feel and, and get some blood work. Just have a conversation. Let's find out if you're a candidate. Maybe pellets is something that's going to work great for you. Maybe it's just thyroid, but have the conversation with Jade so then you know. And I know that consultation can be covered under insurance. I know the blood work can be covered under insurance, or you guys have a great cash rate even might even save money from a uh, high lab deductibles. And then if you choose to move forward, right, with the pellet procedure, then Denise, um, it could be right two to four times a year that you do it. And how much is the actual pellet procedure if they choose to do so? The original, the, the pellet procedure itself is 397. That includes the uh, pellets. Perfect, regardless of dose. Yeah, and Correct. HSA, FSA, that is a cash procedure, um, but HSA and FSAs are covering that as well. Okay, great question. What else? None, none at this time. Okay, I know one question I get a lot is, um, does it hurt? <laughs> um, and the answer is no, especially with Jade. Um, it is totally numbed and um, a numb procedure, don't feel a thing, it might take three minutes for women and there's no stitch required, it's just a little steri strip put on the top of it. And um, the next day you might feel a little, you know, um, oh, it feels a little sore or maybe a bruise or not. Um, I receive pellets every three months for the last eight and a half years or so. So do the math and um, um, it doesn't, hurt <laughs> it shouldn't hurt when you have someone's doing it the right way well, I do have I do have another question here in reference to the difference between the trochee and um, the pellet um, this patient's been using it for seven years is uh, there any difference in the you know the method as far as the getting the uh, hormone in and from the tongue to sure do you want to take the stage do you want me to Sure, sure. So um, really, it's just the absorption is a little bit different as far as trochee and pellet. Um, like we talked about with pellet, you maintain a little bit more consistent levels versus taking, say, a trochee in the morning and then you kind of have a higher level and then it kind of tends to trend down a little bit throughout the day. Um, is a trochee a bad method? Absolutely not. I think if you're doing bioidentical hormones, you're being proactive in your care and you're taking the steps you need to as far as protecting yourself. Um, when it comes to dosing, I like to really let women know, um, no, no matter how the method, uh, it comes down to what works best for the, for the individual. And everyone's super, super different. Um, I have a lot of clients who travel quite a bit. And so the idea of putting on a cream once or twice a day or taking a lozenge once or twice a day can be a little overwhelming and it's very hard to be compliant with. Um, and therefore pellets are awesome. They're such a great way to do it because they come see me, 
we place the pellets and then they're really, really good for anywhere between three to five months until they see me the next time. So no matter the delivery method, I think it just comes down to the person and it's very unique to them. Another question is, is that has, have you been any uh, responses to any reactions to the pellets? And of course they can't be removed. So what happens in that instant? So I really honestly do not run into this often. I haven't in my practice run into that. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Uh, of course it happens that we are placing a pellet under the skin. There's always some mild risk of a localized reaction, whether it be to the lidocaine or the adhesive we're using to close the, close the small um, incision we're making, which is more likely than the pellet itself. The pellet itself is just hormone. So it's exactly what your body creates. Um, it doesn't have anything that's gonna be cause an allergic reaction, um, more likely to run into complications with how the pellet themselves were placed. Um, and therefore it's super important that you do find a provider who's familiar with it and comfortable with it and knows what they're doing. Great. And like you said, so um, it's great to, to piggyback on that. Um, what are the cons? So one thing I know most people and myself, I wanted to know before, it, what's the worst that can happen, right? Is it harmful? And the cool thing about any bioidentical, in, if there are symptoms of excess, and I'll explain what that might be, they're temporary, they're treatable, and they're non-harmful. So that's the cool part first. But what you can possibly see when you first absorb a pellet, um, like my mom who was on a patch, she wasn't absorbing adequate levels. And once that pellet came in and truly absorbed, she went from the outhouse to the penthouse, right? And that ride, that elevator ride was pretty quick. And she had a little bit of water retention. So she felt a little bit of swelling. And I did the first time too, like my rings were tight. Now I could have done a little diuretic or a little progesterone, but it went away and it didn't bother me. Um, other things that um, could happen on that rise is possibly a little acne, um, a little breakout. Now, I don't want to freak everybody out. That doesn't mean you're going to become a pizza face um, or a chia pet. Everyone's wondering about, you know, hair growth. Um, but typically, it's that transition, if anything. And we have a specific dosing site that takes your blood work, blood work and your mm -hmm. symptoms to get a spot on 95% of the time to conservative on that dose. We always feel we can add more. We'd rather be conservative and add more than have too much and then have to treat, you know, the symptoms and for a couple of weeks, um, not maybe, you know, feel bloated. So um, those are the typical ones. Um, extrusions are extremely rare, but that's just where a pellet would come back out. Um, extremely rare in women. And um, that's pretty much it. Anything else, Jay, in regards to cons? That's about it as well, yeah. All right, Julie. Yeah. After eight years of using, do you uh, do you any experience any um, scarring in the area? Oh, good question. Um, most of the time, I've got to really like look at where any marks are um, on my skin. Now I'm light skinned. Um, my husband's Hawaiian, and he has a little bit darker skin, so I can see his a little bit more. Um, on super dark skin, or if you have, you know, possibility of keloiding, that is a possibility. You are just kind of breaking the skin. So um, a lot of places though, that have a little laser, um, for me, it's not a problem, but if you have darker skin or if it just bothers you, um, that little laser, I don't know if um, where in the air, in your area or if Pearl Women's Center has that, but a lot of times women will just get that, you know, zip, zap, and it's gone. So no, I haven't had that issue. Anything else? I think I might be able to see now. Um, does the pellet just evolve? I can see it now. Um, yes, the pellets completely dissolve. Like Jade said, the hormones, uh, the pellets are made of pure hormone, less than 2% steric acid as a binding agent. And those are all things our bodies make. There are no allergic or drug drug interactions, no allergic reactions from the pellet themselves. If there's any allergic reaction or reaction, like Jade stated, it's gonna be from, from the local or the tape, um, something well Benadryl usually takes care of. Um, any other questions you see, Jer uh, I must said Jordan, if <laughs> you're on there, Denise, that we missed? No, not, not at this time. 
I see one that says, can my baseline be all the testing I had done two years ago when I ran multiple tests at my, um, on my levels for trying to get pregnant? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I always recommend we get new labs. It depends, of course, when you had it done. I would say two years, if it was me seeing this individual, I'd probably want newer labs just because hormones do change as we age. Uh, and I want to make sure that whatever dosing I am um, basing um, or using my labs to base off of, I want to make sure that it's very accurate. Thank you. I see another one in regards to Hashimoto's or my thyroid looks normal, but I still have thyroid symptoms. That's very common, much more common than people realize. And um, it depends on one, the type of test that you're physician or whomever said your levels were normal, that you, maybe you don't need thyroid. Um, TSH is a common test that most will look at and fail to look at a free T3 or even a free T3 and T4. If you want to assist with metabolism, constipation, energy, dry skin, brittle nails, thinning hair, you need to look at free T3. You need a either desiccated thyroid or a T4 and T4 product um, to help with those symptoms relief. Okay. And that's something that uh, Jade can definitely look at, look over with you. Um, with regards to le uh, labs, usually we do labs initially, we need to know where we're starting from after, if you receive a pellet therapy, we want to know where you're at afterwards, make sure you're in a protective level along with how you feel. And then usually it's just once a year, we just do a check-in. Um, Another common question I get though is, um, you know, how long will I know it starts to work? And a lot of women might feel something within a couple of weeks, but you should feel something by four weeks. And typically the first symptoms that go away are the first symptoms to come back. So Jade again is gonna individualize a specific dose for you. She's gonna set the dose and you're gonna set the frequency. You know how you feel your best. And again, the more active you are, the more your body needs it. It's going to burn through it. So I like to be in the gym in the mornings. Um, I get my pellets every three months. My mom's form of exercise is shopping for shoes. So she lasts much closer to five months, if that makes sense. Um, anything else here? Is there any reason a patient would not be a good fit or eligible for bioidentical hormones rather than synthetic? Um, I don't know of anybody who would rather have a synthetic um, with a potential side effects than a bioidentical. And is there any research around um, the BRCA variant and bioidentical hormones yet? There is tons of literature on bioidentical hormones and breast cancer. Um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Glazer is a breast cancer surgeon in Dayton, Ohio. She has tons of literature, her and Dimitri Caucus, European journals, um, but just finished an, an additional um, study that was a 10 year cohort. And all of her patients, again, are breast cancer patients. Um, they showed, or her study showed, 40% reduction in breast cancer recurrence mortality, and she uses pellet therapy. Um, Dr. Donovitz, founder of BioT, he just finished and we just published in European Journal that um, we had found a 35.5% reduction in breast cancer recurrence mortality. So there is tons. Um, just a reminder, pellets have been around since 1939, and um, there's a lot of literature out there that a lot of us aren't aware of, but um, it is. Um, more specifically, would new labs be compared to labs two years ago to tell what's needed? Not necessarily. Jade, do you want to... Not necessarily. It's, it'd be very helpful. I mean, the more information that you can give me on your history and labs um, is only going to you know, benefit your care and give me an idea of what you are like uniquely, um, but it's not going to be what necessarily I base your dosing off of. Thank you. Um, one other thing I'll put you back um, when that question came up, is there any reason a patient wouldn't be eligible for bioidenticals? If you have, um, there are a couple of patients that wouldn't be candidates. Um, one, if you're actively trying to conceive, um, we would probably say just conceive, have your baby and, and we'll pellet you afterwards. Um, on the flip side, if you have pellet therapy and then all of a sudden you could become pregnant, no big deal, no harm. We're just not going to continue while you're pregnant. As soon as you have the baby, then um, we can continue pellet therapy. And same thing with men. Any type of replacement therapy is going to drop that sperm count down. It's not birth control, but it can drop it down. So conceive and then the male counterpart can receive pellets. 
You see anything else, Denise? I am not seeing anything else. I think you guys touched on a lot of those questions. Okay, awesome. If we did not, or if we skipped your question, if it was not answered, please type it in again. And until then, or if we see any more pop up, Denise, would you come to the final fun part of tonight and talk about these gifts? Because I'm really excited. Sure. About I have three. I have three gifts I'm giving away, and they are vouchers for care here at the Peril Women's Center. And I have the first uh, winner is uh, what is Al it? Pierce. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. What are what, what? are we? What are they winning? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, oh, okay. I'm, something's going on here. Hold on. There we go. Okay. We got a hundred dollar voucher, a two hundred and fifty dollar voucher, and a five hundred dollar voucher. Ooh. And this is yeah. a voucher to use on any cash service. So if it's pellet therapy or nutraceuticals or Botox or correct. Right? Awesome. That's okay. correct. So so who what amount are is going to this person first? Doing the 150? Is that right? We have 100 for loose for L peers. And two is is she with us tonight? What's her first name? Did you say Lucy? It it's L Piers. L Piers. Okay, she has one hundred and fifty dollars. One hundred. Yep. And then my two hundred and fifty dollar uh, voucher goes to Martha A. And then my um, five hundred goes to Heather N. Awesome. Martha, you are a winner. Heather, you are a winner. And L Piers, you are a winner. Um, so how can they, um, they just come to the clinic or will it we be, will be to we, them? We will reach out to them within the next 24 hours. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the other gift for anybody who's attended, even if you haven't attended and you're listening to maybe this recording, you are more than welcome to go into the clinic and pick up a free copy of Dr. Donovan's book on testosterone, um, uh, Aging Healthier, Living Happier. And those are an easy, great read. He's um, engaging and uh, talks a lot about symptoms and women's health initiative and safety and bioidenticals, et cetera. So anybody can walk into um, the clinic and ask for the book. Um, and I do see one other question here. So men can also do pellet therapy. Yes, they can. I know Pro Women's Center is specializing in women. Um, but Jade also specializes in couples because women's health is about your significant other as well. So, um, 